again to Sunday morning worship here at Barnes Baptist Church on what is Pentecost Sunday, the Sunday when the church remembers, celebrates, commemorates the coming of the promised Holy Spirit upon those who were gathered together in that upper room ten days after Jesus had ascended back into heaven. Good to be with you once again and uh, I'm sure the Lord has been good to you during this last week. We'd love to hear from you, so please do get in touch and uh, send, and perhaps we can even share your messages with others on latter Sundays. But let's turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, and read Luke's account of that first Pentecost. Luke's account in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? 
Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. We sing together, Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Holy Spirit of God, on the day of Pentecost you came once for all to the church as the gift of the exalted Lord. Come to us in your grace and power today we pray to make Jesus real to us, to teach us more about him and to deepen our faith in him, that we may be changed into his likeness and be his witnesses in the world to the glory of God the Father. We pray, Lord, that each one of us will be open this day to receive from you. So, Lord, we ask you to come and touch our lives as you will. Fill us in you, we pray, with your presence. Come, Lord, bring in your forgiveness for our sins, Come, Lord, Holy Spirit, filling us with your person. 
Come, Lord, Holy Spirit, and make us more like the Lord Jesus, that we may find our fullness and our hope in him. For this we ask in his name. Amen. Just a few notices before we continue this morning. Um, many of you will know that our sister Jane sadly broke her right ankle a couple of days ago. She is currently in Kingston Hospital awaiting surgery. That was supposed to happen today, but has now been postponed until tomorrow, Monday. So please do remember Jane in your prayers. I know a number of you have already been in contact with her and she is very, very grateful for your prayers and for the love that reaches out to her at this time. She's feeling okay, a little apprehensive, but she knows that the Lord is with her. So Jane, as you watch this service later on, we're all here for you, but more so the Lord as you know, is with you and will see you through. Now, each day at nine o'clock, please remember we have our time of prayer as a church at 9 p.m. each and every day. And if you haven't been involved so far, then please contact Esther and she can send you the prayer list, prayer updates, news about prayers that have been answered, new prayer requests that have come in. Contact Esther for the updated prayer list. But we join together as a church wherever we are at nine o'clock every day in prayer. This Wednesday, we start a new study course. Um, it will be, as previously, by email, as we did with Andrew, looking at the Holy Spirit of the last few weeks. In a way, we'll be continuing those studies but from Acts chapter 3, from Acts chapter 3. So if you want to be involved and have the questions sent to you prior to our meeting up online on Wednesday at quarter to eight, then please get in touch with me. Uh, you should all have my email. So get in touch with me and I'll ensure that you have the questions that you can work on, think about prior to the meeting itself when it's up to you whether you share your answers and reflections with others or just keep them to yourself and read what others are sending you. And finally, um, please remember to keep in touch um, by email, phone calls, whatever. We're still a church, though divided, we are yet one in Christ Jesus. Please remember to keep in touch and please do continue to send in your words for today. Uh, they dried up a little bit recently. Uh, be good to hear from a few more of you. A word for today to share with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Once again, that is done by email. Send them to me, an email to me, and I will circulate them later in the week. And also, please let Esther know of any further prayer requests or answers to prayer that you want included for our daily prayer time. And finally, uh, if you have any reflections or suggestions for this service, then, or you know, any, any hymn, song requests, for instance, please let us know and we'll do our best to include them on further Sundays. So thank you for that. Now let's turn back to our worship as once again we welcome the Holy Spirit here with us this day and indeed every day. Holy Spirit, we welcome you.
Before I go on to our prayer, um, let me bring in Norma, because she is um, doing the prayer today, but if um, she can't come in, in the camera, um, we go ahead and pray. Uh, would you go ahead and pray? Lead us in prayer. Thank you.
Thank you, Norma. And um, um, we carry on with our second Bible reading of today. And this is in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 32, 32 to 42. 47. 47. And this is Peter still um, praying. Then Peter stood up with the eleven. Okay, God has raised him. What word is that? Verses 32 to 42. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Norma. And Thank you, Esther. Let's sing once again the splendor of the King. Oh, I have three. 
Let us pray. And we pray, Lord, that as we come to look at your word once again, it will do nothing less than show us again how great you are, how gracious you are, how good you are. So bless this word to us, I ask, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles once again to Acts chapter 2. And there we read of surprise, of confusion, of consternation surrounding the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. We read of bewilderment, of people amazed, perplexed, asking one another in verse 12, what does this mean? And it's in response to that question that Peter stands up and addresses the crowd, quoting from the Old Testament and declaring that all that is happening is happening as fulfilment of prophecies given by God through the prophet Joel, through King David, long, long ago. Now Peter's declaration and Peter's explanation of what's happening takes up most of that chapter, Acts chapter 2. But in fact, the whole book of Acts is an explanation and outworking of the spectacular events of that first Pentecost day. But going back to the day itself, what did the coming of the Holy Spirit mean? then? And what does his coming mean to us now, even today? Well, perhaps most importantly, first of all, we should recognise that the coming of the Holy Spirit was the coming of God himself. The coming of God himself. Look at verses 2 and 3. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. Wind and fire. But wind and fire, unlike wind and fire as we know them, and did you notice how Luke doesn't give too precise a description? Look again at those verses. He tells us that it was a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Of verse 4, what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. So there was obviously more to this phenomena than met the eye. And it was a symbolism that would not have been lost on the gathered followers of Jesus. For wind and fire in the scriptures, the Old Testament as we know it, often are used to indicate the presence of God himself. For instance, in the book of Job, 38, chapter 38, verse 1, Job answered God out of the whirlwind. Ezekiel's vision of God in the first chapter of his book, verse 4, is preceded by a windstorm coming out from the north. In fact, both the Hebrew and the Greek words for wind, ruah and pneuma, can also, given the right context, be translated as spirit. Wind, spirit, spirit, wind. And Jesus, in fact, links the two together 
on that night when he spoke to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 verse 8. Speaking, teaching him about the Holy Spirit. He said, the wind blows wherever it pleases, Nicodemus. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. But did you notice that on the day of Pentecost, Luke does tell us where that violent wind came from. It, verse 2, came from heaven, the place that they had seen Jesus ascend to just ten days earlier. So there could be no doubt in his followers' mind that this was the promise, the promised gift that Jesus had spoken of. The gift that Jesus had spoken of in personal terms, that he will come to you, that he will lead you, that he will speak. The gift of the promised Holy Spirit. Now, fire, likewise, was a symbol that was used in the scriptures, a powerful symbol of God's presence. Do you remember how God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush? And also, just prior to the giving of the Ten Commandments, we read in Exodus chapter 19, verse 18, that Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. Fire being synonymous with God's holiness and his absolute purity. So never forget, never forget that when we speak of the Holy Spirit, when we experience the Holy Spirit, we are speaking about, we are experiencing God himself. Not the presence of a second or third rate divine presence, let alone an impersonal presence. For his presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit is nothing less than the presence of the Father and the Son, God himself. If anyone loves me, Jesus told his disciples in John 14, 23, he will obey my teaching and my Father will love him and we, Father, Son, we will come to him and make our home with him. Indeed, John the Baptist had prophesied that though I baptise you with water, Luke 3.16, one more powerful than I, he was thinking of Jesus, will come and he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. It is he who comes to, to us and dwells within us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Saviour and Lord. And though we won't experience the wind and the fire as the followers of Jesus experienced on that first Pentecost, his coming will nevertheless be a decisive declaration for us of our being in Christ and of Christ. As it was then, so it has been for each and every Christian since. So the coming of the Holy Spirit, first and foremost, we need to recognise as the coming of God himself. And God still invests nothing less than himself in us when we too become followers of Jesus Christ. What a thought, what a privilege, 
What a gift that is. But secondly, the coming of the Holy Spirit signified the beginning of a worldwide mission. But did you notice, it wasn't the violent wind or the tongues of fire that caused the bewilderment and the amazement among the crowd in Jerusalem. I mean, both of these had occurred within the house where the followers had gathered and were praying. It was what happened next. Verses 4 and 6. All of them, the followers of Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them, verse 4. And verse 6, when they, that is the people round about the house, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own tongue. Now these tongues were not the spiritual gift of tongues, the tongues of angels that Paul speaks about in his letters to the Corinthians. These were the tongues of men. The tongues of men. Other languages that were recognised by the Jews who had come on pilgrimage to Jerusalem from all over the Roman world and beyond. And they were absolutely amazed at what they heard. They couldn't understand how this group of common, largely uneducated men and women could be so linguistically proficient. But though some mocked and said, they've had too much wine, others, understandably, asked the obvious question. What does this mean? What does this mean? And that gave Peter his opportunity to speak. Peter, the chief denier, remember, was now a changed man. He was a man who had been reinstated by Jesus into the fellowship of disciples. And he was a man now empowered and emboldened by the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit within him. And so he tells them about Jesus. He tells them how Jesus had been crucified and raised to life by God. He tells them how they too need to repent of their sin and their rebellion against God. And, verse 38, be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See how boldly he speaks. You see, Peter is now a man of utter conviction. A man who truly knows Jesus. And if you would truly know Jesus, you need to know that God's requirement of each and every one of us has not changed. Whoever we are, wherever we are, God calls upon us to repent of our sins to accept his forgiveness and to be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. And now as Peter speaks, and as the crowd listen to what he's saying, we can see a further significance of those tongues of fire. For not only has Peter's tongue been loosened, to speak to others about Jesus. So the speaking of other languages 
that the crowd has heard that has drawn them to this place testifies to another prophetic fulfillment. Again and again, the patriarchs and the prophets had spoken of the one who would bring God's rule, the kingdom of God, to earth. It was a prophecy and a blessing that Israel again and again sought either to forget or to choose to overlook, preferring to see themselves as the sole beneficiaries of God's promise. But those prophecies and those promises simply would not go away until as Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 to 5, the time had fully come and God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons and daughters of God. True, Jesus' ministry had concentrated on the lost sheep of Israel. But he had also made it clear that what he had come to do, he had come to do for the world. And this was made clear once again with his parting instructions to those he commissioned to continue his ministry just before he returns to heaven he tells them that they were to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name to all nations. To be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the ends of the earth. Acts 1 verse 8. And this outpouring of the Spirit and this speaking in other languages signifies just that. That the good news of Jesus Christ was good news for and good news to be taken to the whole world. The whole world. Now it's the beginning of that missionary work that we read about in the rest of the book of Acts. But it's a work that doesn't come to an end, isn't concluded with the end of the book in Acts chapter 28 verse 31, where incidentally we read of Paul boldly and without hindrance preaching the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, not in Jerusalem, but in Rome, the centre of the Roman Empire. And it's a work, the Lord's commission to all who receive his spirit, that we are to continue to be about. Jesus came because God so loved the world. And it is into the world that God loves that we are to go with the good news of Jesus. Now, in this age of globalisation, we find in cities such as London that the world has in fact come to us. And we have amazing opportunities as multiracial, multicultural churches to show the world, to be a prophetic witness as to what life in God's kingdom is like. Just as the speaking in tongues on that first day of Pentecost declared that this Jesus is for the world, so our multiracial, our multicultural witness is to be a sign to the world that this is the way, Jesus' way, that humanity's hope and humanity's unity lies. And to that end, churches and Christians 
that practice or tolerate any form of racial or cultural exclusion, social prejudice or sexual discrimination are the antithesis of what God calls us to be. Not a blessing, they are a blot on the communal landscape. For in Christ Jesus, as Paul writes to the Christians in Galatia, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. One in Christ Jesus. The coming of the Holy Spirit was the coming of God himself. And his enabling of Jesus' followers to speak in tongues signified that theirs was indeed to be a worldwide mission, taking the good news of Jesus out into the world. And finally, thirdly, this morning, the coming of the Holy Spirit brought about the birth of the church. The birth of the church. Pentecost, you probably know, is often referred to as the birthday of the church. And certainly, until the Holy Spirit came, until Jesus' followers had been clothed with power from on high, nothing of lasting significance could have happened. It was with the coming of Holy Spirit, that this group of about 120 disciples, men and women, received the power it needed to go out into the world. His coming, we read, transformed them from a prayerful but passive group of individuals into an energised body of spirit-filled believers ready for mission. But more than that, his coming brought them a unity of fellowship that saw them, Acts 2 verse 42, devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. A unity of Christian fellowship that we call the church. Together, in that fellowship, the believers became what Paul was later to describe as the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Men and women indwelt and empowered by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, to be for the world what Jesus was for Israel. And to that end, that outward transformation was symptomatic of an inner transformation as well. The Holy Spirit at work on the outside, but the Holy Spirit at work within as well. Without the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church would at best have been a stillbirth. And without the Holy Spirit, the Christian is but Christian in name without the divine inner dwelling that makes it possible for him or her to become the person Jesus calls us to be. It's no wonder then that Paul writing to the Christians in Rome, Romans 8 verse 9, declares that if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, if anyone does not have the Holy Spirit, he or she simply does not belong to Christ. You see, the Holy Spirit is that essential. That essential. For the Christian life, for the church life, for the life that Jesus calls us to, for the person Jesus calls us to be. You see, without Him, without the Holy Spirit, we are like a kite without the wind. A hearth without the fire, a medium without a message. 
It is because of the Holy Spirit and thanks to the Holy Spirit that the Christian, indeed the church, is not equal to the, to the sum of its parts. It is because of the Holy Spirit and thanks to the Holy Spirit that we not only have a purpose, but the means by which that purpose can be achieved. It is thanks to the Holy Spirit, God's personal investment in us, that the work of Jesus goes on in the world outside and in us, and will go on and be completed and reach its promised end. So, his coming was the coming of God himself. His coming signified the beginning of worldwide mission, Christ for the world. His coming brought about the birth of the church. And the rest of the book of Acts tells us how that work progressed. How the church took the good news of Jesus Christ out into the world. And you and me, and our church and yours, we also have a part to play in continuing to tell that story, in continuing the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, indwelt, empowered by that same Holy Spirit, Christ in us, and Christ for the world. Let us pray. So we thank you, gracious God, for your gift of Holy Spirit, that you should come to indwell each Christian life is indeed a wonder beyond our understanding. Thank you that we don't have to understand such things to receive your blessings. Thank you that you only ask us to trust you and open our heart to you. To believe in the Lord Jesus, repenting of our sin, receiving your forgiveness, being baptised as a testimony to what you have done and are doing in us. And we too will receive your indwelling presence, the Holy Spirit. Receiving his presence to be with us, to empower us, to transform and guide us in your way. Lord, may our hearts be open that you may come in. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us conclude our service this morning as we sing together that wonderful Charles Wesley hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excel.
Well, once again, thank you for being with us this, what is for us, Sunday, well, it's now Sunday afternoon. Just gone five past twelve here in Barnes in England. Good to be with you. Please join us again next Sunday or if possible on Wednesday at nine o'clock as we join together in, oh no, daily at nine o'clock as we join together in prayer and Wednesday at quarter to eight for our Bible study. Let me know if you want to be part of that please. Thank you for um, thank you for being with us. But um, if you have any questions about um, the preaching today, um, let us know. Our email address is uh, barnesbaptistchurch at gmail .com. Or um, if you have any particular uh, needs, please please let us know as well. And um, our pastor will show you. Um, how to become a Christian or how do we grow in our Christian lives and if you have time um, the message as well of how to become a Christian is um, on our website or our um, Facebook page and please um, um, have a look and it's in there but uh, we would love to hear from you so the grace of the Lord let's uh, join together as we say May the, the grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ and, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Have a lovely day and um, we'll see you next Sunday and uh, Wednesday for the Bible study. Also, just a quick announcement. Um, from tomorrow, six people are allowed to meet together for um, fellowship for anything but only outdoors so um, we can actually meet outside if you want to come and um, uh, see us or, or we would like to see you and maybe we would have a barbecue and let us know who could come six people from tomorrow and then perhaps in the coming weeks that might grow into uh, more people being able to meet outdoors. So, um, hope to see you again soon. And uh, remember, that is for England only. Yes. Scotland has their um, own guidelines. Wales and Northern Ireland has have their own guidelines as well. But in England, six of us can meet together. Bye.